It's Thursday, March 3rd, and the time for your body this today morning news update. Minister of Health and Wellness Ian Gudinagel has outlined the plans for a shake-up of the healthcare system in Barbados as he seeks to improve efficiency and reduce a backlog of people awaiting various operations. The minister told lawmakers on Wednesday that the cash-strapped Queen Elizabeth Hospital will be a significant priority for his ministry in the coming years as part of a five-year capital expenditure program to modernize and improve healthcare delivery on the island. We will focus on what is achievable, and what, we, what can be delivered in this fin coming financial year with a clear understanding of what capital requirements are necessary. On assuming office, I instructed the executive chairman to prepare of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital to prepare a five-year capital expenditure program for the ministry's review. The capital expenditure program will involve stakeholder participation to better understand what is needed at the QEH to enhance efficiency and effectiveness. The capital works strategy and plan, along with other critical improvements in hospital quality, human resource planning, improved access to pharmaceuticals, medical technologies, and cardiac care, both pre-hospital and in-hospital care, so as to improve patient care and ensure successful outcomes. Having asked for the information on the most pressing outstanding issues and how they should be prioritized, I have been advised that urgent and immediate action should be given to the correction of a long-standing problem at the hospital, namely the long list of overdue and varied surgical operations that have piled up over the last several years. The health minister said his ministry was currently exploring partnerships with an aim of reducing the backlog. I've already signaled to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital that overdue surgeries will have to be brought up to date. To this end, we are devising plans to address how to reduce this backlog, including out-of-the-box commercial thinking. To do so, we will have to do all we can to get the Lions Eye Care Center up and running to ensure that those on the waiting list who cannot afford to pay for private eye surgeries can have them done at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital free of cost. The time has come for those who work hard to send us to school to help build this country must no longer in their time of need be left in a painful state. The capital expenditure plan will include getting the 12 operating theaters back into full operation. Currently, nine theaters are operational, and those responsible will be required to have all 12 theaters working during the day and night. Another example is the backlog of some approximately 1,800 persons waiting for CT scans. We are reviewing options to come up with a quick and satisfactory solution. The overall objective of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is now execution with precision driven by results. The rate at which elderly persons are being abandoned at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital continues to be of grave concern for health officials, and they are taking steps to alleviate that problem while at the same time expanding spaces available for geriatric care. This issue was raised by Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Janet Phillips, during Wednesday's debate on the Appropriation Bill 2022 in the House of Assembly. She said numerous appeals for Barbadians to stop leaving their elderly family members stranded at the QEH have fallen on deaf ears. We have been plagued with the issue as Minister would have alluded to of having many persons left we call it elderly for care, and we also have a, a carrier of person called young for care. These people are being left in the QEH, they're not being collected by their relatives, and then the, the burden then falls on the persons at the QEH hospital to manage them, as well as manage critical care per persons. And it is an issue that we've been trying to, to grapple with, whilst trying to deal with the issue of COVID. We have put a temporary measure in place where we have now turned what was form, formerly the, um, the St. Lucy District Hospital. It had been um, had transitioned from being a district hospital to uh, a quarantine facility. We've put it now as a quarantine facility for those persons, those elderly persons who have been left at QEH to transition there until we can find spaces in the geriatric system. That in itself is still a challenge for QEH and on a daily basis we, we get the reports of persons who are left and they are clogging up the spaces, not only in the oxygen and emergency, but on, and they're also taking up valuable bed space that is needed for critical care patients. 
Phillips said the former Elaine's Canterbury Centre at Riverby St. Lucy will soon be used for geriatric care after some much-needed repairs. We are working on the roof. We are hoping to get it finished before the end of this financial year. So that will free up an additional 28 bed spaces so that we can help the QEH relieve some of the congestion of the elderly persons in the hospital. But you know when there's a vacuum, then there, there's room for persons to then bring more persons. And the issue is a white issue, and I, I agree with you, um, um, Member Parliament, for that we need to have a really expansive educational program. You need to take care of your family. And if you can't take care of your family, then you work in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and Wellness to help them. But QBH should not be a dumping ground for old people who have sought, who has labored and toiled in the fields and have sent us to school and made us men and women. People come and they dump their family members. They don't look back. And then they, they leave the, the, um, the whole burden on the state. It has to be a collaborative approach. As There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi. I am Onika. I am a mother, I am a daughter, and I am a wine educator. When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental, so at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic, and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses, and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To news from the region, a lack of access to timely care and disruptions to prenatal services are to blame for an increase in maternal mortality in the Americas during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's according to Director of the Pan-American Health Organization, Dr. Clarissa Etienne. She said data from across the region has made it very clear that COVID had a staggering impact on maternal mortality. Disruptions to prenatal services and lack of access to timely care led to more expectant women dying across our region. There was a large increase in mortality among pregnant women in the United States beginning in August of 2021 after the Delta variant had become predominant. The highest number of cases were among Hispanic and white non-Hispanic women. Pregnant women are also among those most vulnerable to COVID-19 due to changes in their immune system, which can put them at risk for severe disease. Over the past two years, more than 365,000 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in pregnant women in the Americas. And sadly, over 3,000 of them died. Dr. Etienne said Pau had just completed a study tracking COVID deaths among pregnant women across eight countries in the Americas. That one in three women who required critical care did not access it in time. And over 90% of 447 pregnant women in the study were already experiencing life-threatening symptoms when admitted to the hospital. Nearly 77% delivered their babies prematurely, and nearly 60% of these children were born with low birth weight. And this can lead an influence such as lifelong health. This is a tragedy, especially now that we have safe and effective vaccines. Even though most countries in the region recommend the vaccination of pregnant women, their uptake of COVID-19 vaccines is still very low. Furthermore, while in some places, young women remain unvaccinated in Latin America and the Caribbean, 
unmet family planning needs among adolescents is about 25%. This underscores the need for the health empowerment of women and girls. And so finally, on the international front, the chief of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhaman Gabriso, says it is still too early to declare victory over the COVID-19 pandemic, despite a decline in deaths globally. There are still many countries with high rates of hospitalization and death and low rates of vaccine coverage. And with high transmission, the threat of a new and more dangerous variant remains very real. We continue to urge all people in all countries to exercise caution, and we urge all governments to support their people to protect themselves and others. We must also remember that the effects of the pandemic go far beyond the death and disease caused by the virus itself. In particular, COVID-19 has taken a heavy toll on mental health. A new WHO report estimates that in the first year of the pandemic, the global prevalence of anxiety and depression increased by more than 25%. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.